Lord, um, as we open your word now, open our hearts to this uh, tremendous, staggering truth that, that the word became flesh and lived among us. And may that truth be truth that shapes the way we live and relate to our neighborhoods and communities so that this Christmas reality may be earthed and grounded for us in a life of obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's this young lad, um, year five in primary school. I guess that means he was about eight, eight or nine. Anyway, he and his class were given an overnight assignment by the teacher to write one page on, uh, on their family roots. So he, he went home and uh, asked his mum as she was pre- preparing dinner uh, for the evening meal, Mum, where, where, where did I come from? Well, busy preparing the meal and distracted, she ran for cover. Oh, the stork brought you. But the boy now, curious, persisted. Uh, Mum, then where did you come from? Well, trapped, the mother just had to keep going at that point. Well, the stork brought me too. Grandma happened to be visiting for the weekend, so the boy went to Grandma to check out the story. Grandma, where did you come from? Thinking for a moment, Grandma played the straight bat. Why? The stork brought me, of course. Well, the boy quietly went upstairs to his bedroom, sat down slowly, opened his notebook, and with his head shaking, he wrote, there has not been a normal birth in our family for three generations. Do you know, at one level, I guess that when Mary was told that she was going to, to give birth to God's son, it might just as well have been the stork theory for her. We know her question in the narrative, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Mary, Mary knew how things worked. And a baby without a, without a human father was not how things worked. Not, not then, not now. So here is Mary. She is, in fact, uh, for us tonight, the last in our Dare to Believe series. Because what she was asked to believe has to be the most extraordinary truth in the universe. That God the Creator would shrink himself to a tiny zygote, no bigger in diameter than a strand of of human hair. All of the vastness of God confined in the womb of a virgin. Yet yet this is the, uh, the very mystery at the heart of our Christian faith. This is the real Christmas story, that in the fully human life of Jesus, God became fully man. And all of us, whoever we are, all of us are invited to dare to believe that, to believe that in Jesus, we actually encounter God, not a version of God, but the exact representation of God's being in human form. For there is no true Christianity without the mystery of the stable, the fusion of two natures, divine and human, in one person, God the Son. There can be no true Christian faith without the audacity to believe that, to hang one's whole life and destiny upon the miracle of a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea become a child on earth for me. Let's return to to the children and their awkward questions. You're in the car, driving along, minding your own business as we do, 
And little Jimmy asks you from the back seat, Dad, where was I before I was born? I mean, children ask the craziest questions, don't they? Dad, where was I before I was born? Well, son, uh, uh, you were nowhere. Uh, before you were born, you didn't exist. Now, whether you're 8 or 28 or 88, that, that's way out there. The truth about existence is that you did not exist before you were born. So, so, so when a man and, and a woman make a baby, a new being that did not exist before is created. A whole new person comes into being. But listen, that's not what happened to Jesus. When Jesus was born, he existed before. Before Bethlehem, before the womb of Mary, before time and space, Jesus predates his birth in Bethlehem. Now, that is not the case with a normal birth. But it is the case with the virgin birth. For Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the eternal Trinity. And when the second person of the Trinity became a man, a new being wasn't created. No. The eternal Son of God became what he was not, a man without ever ceasing to be what he was, God. Do you see that in Jesus, the God who is beyond time comes into time? The architect of space and matter itself becomes space and matter. It is profound. Before I get too further carried away with the theology and the implications of the virgin birth, let, let's just see now how, how Mary's story, that's what we're calling it tonight, how Mary's story unfolds in Luke's account. It begins there in verse 26 of chapter 1 of, of the gospel. In the sixth month... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. In the sixth month. What's that a time reference to? In the sixth month? Well, that's a reference to the fact that Elizabeth, Mary's infertile, beyond childbearing age cousin, is in the sixth month of her surprise pregnancy. Like many great narratives, Mary's story is folded within and related to this other story, Elizabeth's. And both, do you see how, how, how both in our Bibles, both take up a large amount of the opening chapter, the opening paragraphs. Uh, Luke, Doc, Dr. Luke, of course, he has no problem, apparently, with writing what he calls in the opening sentences of the gospel, this orderly account of reliable history that he has carefully investigated and researched through eyewitnesses, Luke, the doctor, has no problem at all in saying, look, here is my carefully investigated, good history, well-researched journalism, and then he begins it with this sequence of stories of miracle births and, and angels. For it's an angel who kicks off Mary's story. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel. 
It's true, isn't it, that angels are always apparently very busy at Christmas. G Gabriel has already gone south to, uh, to visit Elizabeth to bring her the good news that she was to be the mother of John the Baptist. Well, now the visitation takes place in the north of the country, uh, in, in Nazareth, as Gabriel pays a visit to this young girl, Mary, who, we're told, is betrothed to the local carpenter, Joseph. It, 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 it probably was a fairly routine day for Mary until Gabriel turned up in the kitchen or at the end of the bed or wherever angels turned up and said, Mary, don't, don't be afraid. Before we hear what else Gabriel says, notice again what Luke is doing here. He, he puts real chronology in the sixth month, real geography, Nazareth in Galilee, real family history of real people, Mary and Joseph, a descendant of David, he puts all of that alongside the supernatural visit of an angel of God and the promise of a miraculous birth. You see what I'm driving at? Real events, real history, real people, real angels, and a real virgin birth. There is no contradiction, in other words, for Dr. Luke or for anyone who understands that we live in a world that is open to the God who made it. God sent the angel. There is Luke nailing his colors to the mast at the very outset of his account of the life of Jesus. He's saying to us, this, this world that we live in, this is not a closed universe where a nameless higher power hovers invisibly over the earth, distant and, and unattached. No, 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 this personal God gets involved in his world. More than that, he shapes his world. He sends an angel. More than that, as we're about to hear, he enters his world. So from the visitation, come next with me to the annunciation. That's simply a posh word for an announcement. But it goes with visitation, doesn't it? The annunciation. Uh, the announcement comes dramatically in two parts. And both parts are set up by that little detail in the previous verse about Mary being a virgin, pledged to marry Joseph. So, so you see, in, in, in the culture of, of the day, girls like Mary, it may sound remarkable to us, but in the culture of the day, girls like Mary would have been usually engaged around aged 12 or 13. And betrothal to Joseph would have been unlike a modern day engagement, but actually a legally binding commitment. And the time between betrothal and the actual mar marriage and wedding would have been very short in order to guarantee the virginity of, of the young Mary. So, you, you see, that little detail all sets up the impossible odds that a teenager who has had no sexual relations is to have a child. Part one of the announcement, if you look at it, has to do with Mary herself. The text, there in verse 28, Hail Mary, full of grace. <laughs> no, that's not what the text says. That's not what the angel said. The angel does not say, Hail Mary, full of grace, but greetings, you who are highly favored. That word favored is used on only one other occasion in the entire New Testament, and it means the free bestowal of God's grace. And just to make sure that Mary gets the idea of grace, the angel Gabriel repeats that in verse 30. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. 
In other words, you've been graced by God. Given grace by God, you've been favored. Let me say something a little about about Mary. Because some Protestant and evangelical traditions can be unnecessarily nervous about how we relate to Mary. She remains, for Bible-believing Christians, one of the most remarkable examples of faith in God anywhere in Scripture. She is, in that sense, someone to be emulated, but listen up, not to be venerated. For, as the angel tells her here, she is to be the recipient of God's grace, not the bestower of it. Yeah? You have found favor with God. In other words, Mary, God has graced you. Why? Well, nothing here in the text says that God has graced her because of anything she did or is. There's no commendation here. Because Mary was not and is not a source of grace. The issue is not Mary's worthiness, but God's beautiful, surprising choice. There were other virgins in Nazareth, no doubt. God could have prepared them. But no, the Lord is with you, Mary, in a way that you cannot fathom. But never forget, it's a free gift of grace. Well, given the fright of the angel's visit upon Mary's conscience and the implications of the angel's announcement about Mary being favored, graced by God. It's hardly surprising that we read in verse 29 of our passage, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Greatly troubled. How how had she, Mary, little Mary, how had she received such grace? She knew who she was, just like like you know who you are tonight. That's why in verse 47 of the chapter, Mary's story becomes Mary's song, the Magnificat, we know it as. And her song begins with the confession, notice, my name is Mary and I am a sinner in need of a savior. My soul glorifies the Lord My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My name is Mary. I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. So, you see, it was disturbing to be told you're going to be graced by God and to know all the while that the reality is that you're just a humble girl engaged to a common carpenter with all the struggles of the heart of any young person. How is it that she could be the object of anything so remarkable and wonderful? Why in the world would an angel come from the very presence of God to tell me? Why me? Has it ever struck you how the arrival of God's grace in our lives does not necessarily make things easy for us. You see, grace does not always come with a smiley face. Grace can perplex. It can disturb. Grace can trouble us and leave us worried. And the rest of Mary's life would be a constant Discovery that grace does not always come in that nice, easy package. Well, that was part one of the announcement. Part two of the announcement is not about her, it's about her baby. Verse 31, you will be with child and give birth to a, to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called son of the most high. 
the Lord God will give him the throne of, of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. He will be great, Mary. Now, the angel Gabriel, if you look at your Bible, uh, the angel Gabriel has actually told Elizabeth about the, 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 the boy that she will give birth to. There in verse 15, he'll be great. Your boy, Elizabeth, will be great in the sight of the Lord. In other words, God is going to make your boy great. But the boy in Mary's womb will be great, unqualified. It isn't something that God does for him. It is something essential to the nature of the child that Mary carries. He will be great. And we see that, don't we, in the life of Jesus? The teaching of Jesus was unlike any teaching that has ever been heard. It was great. His miracles attested to his greatness. Jesus basically banished illness and starvation. He had total authority over the kingdom of darkness and demons. And his greatest miracle was that he was raised from the dead. Yeah, he was great. Great in a way that no one ever else has been. But, but why? Why will he be great like this? Because this child, Mary, this great child is God. That's what defines his greatness. He will be called, look at the text, listen to the text, he will be called Son of the Most High. That's why he's great. Now, if you were a Jew, you would have been very familiar with this expression, the Most High. It, it was a title given exclusively and only to God, El Elyon, the Supreme One, the God who is above all. And, and here, Mary's baby is, is given that title because Mary's baby bears the same essence as God. We each carry the characteristics and nature of our parents. It's in the DNA, as we say. It's in the chromosomes. It's in the genes. It's all about genetics. That's essentially what is being said here about Jesus, the Son of the Most High bears the essence of God. And again, to, to reinforce the point, the angel will say pretty much the same once more in verse 35. The Spirit will come upon you, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Firstly, then, Jesus is God. S secondly, Jesus is man. Come back to verse 31. You'll be with child, Mary, and you'll give birth to a son. The, the most incredible message ever given to any woman, to any human being. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. Though the conception of Jesus is a supernatural, a unique miracle, the rest of the pregnancy would follow the normal course like every other pregnancy. This was to be a normal nine-month development of that little life in the womb of that mother until she gave birth. At one level, you see, Jesus is born just like every other child is born, a truly human baby. You can have a baby, Mary. That is why in, in the next chapter, chapter 2, uh, the angels are busy again. This time they're with the shepherds on the Judean hillsides. And remember, they say to the shepherds, here's the sign, lads. Here's what to look for. Go to Bethlehem, look for a manger, and find an extraterrestrial. No. Find a baby. A human baby. Not some E.T. 
Go to Bethlehem. Look for a manger and find a baby. Mary, call your baby Jesus. That's the Old Testament name Joshua, or better, Yeshua. Yeshua means the God who saves. So there's a third feature of this baby in the announcement. He will save. He'll do what his name says he will do. And, and here, here the, name, the name Jesus begins to bring us into the drama. You see, we can stand back and admire God in human flesh. We can stand back and admire the perfect man, Jesus. But the only way that we can ever know Jesus is if he will forgive our sins and save us. That's how we get to know him. And of course, he came to do just that. And he came to do that because he is both Savior and Lord. That's how the announcement about Mary's baby finishes. Notice in verse 32. He'll be great, will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. There, in that Description of baby Jesus is the entire story of his life summarized in the titles given to him. You have his saving work in the name Jesus. You have his perfect righteous life in the term he'll be great. You have his deity, divinity in the title son of the most high. And you have his resurrection, his ascension, and his glorious return, all bound up, wrapped up in the promise that the Lord would give him the throne of his father David, and that kingdom will be his forever. It's the entirety of Jesus' life summed up in the titles that are given to Mary about him. Some Christian traditions still have Jesus hanging on the cross, don't they? You just have to walk into, into certain churches and, and glance at the symbols and images on the walls to see that Jesus apparently is still dying on the cross. Well, evangelicals have, have done a pretty good job at getting Jesus off the cross because he's no longer there. But you know, I'm not sure we've done a very good job getting him to the throne of his father David because the good news doesn't end with the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, or, or indeed our own personal salvation. That's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will never end. That's the end of the story. It's where Christ will be at the end of time, judge and Lord of all. It's who Jesus is now. King of the cosmos. Like you, I'm sure we all love a good nativity scene at Christmas. We love the kids involved in nativity plays at school. We all love that stuff. They dress up, don't they, in their dressing gowns and their dressing gown cord and the little tea towel headdresses. You know the thing. We all, we all ooh and ah and love that kind of thing at Christmas. But it can provide lots of people with with an excuse to dismiss the whole thing. Oh, Christmas is for babies and for children. Not for people like me. This Jesus, Mary is being told by the angel, is king of the universe. He's Lord. He's come to reign over our lives. He's not a baby anymore. Do you get it? Jesus is God. Jesus is man, Jesus is savior, Jesus is Lord. And all of that 
is downloaded by Gabriel onto Mary. You'll have a baby, Mary, who will be God's eternal son and whose kingdom will know no end. No wonder, no wonder Mary says to Gabriel, hey, can you run that by me once more time? Can I hear that again? Play that back to me again. Or in the words of the text, Mary says there in verse 34, how will this be? How is this going to happen? You've told me, Gabriel, what will be, but how will it be? How can I have a baby without a husband? How, how will this be? I'm a virgin. So, thirdly, the explanation. Here's how. Here's how. Here's the explanation. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That, that, that a woman would become pregnant without a man, unheard of. Never happened. Utterly impossible. Even in a world of IVF and test tube babies and surrogate parents, you need a, a man's sperm and a, a woman's egg. Or oh, we can do some amazing things in, in medical science nowadays, sometimes with questionable ethics. But the genetics of birth still requires two X chromosomes of the woman and the X and Y chromosomes of the man to produce a, a boy or a girl. A female egg only will not do it. And even if we could at some point in the future ever create an environment in which a female egg could reproduce itself, the two X chromosomes would and could only reproduce X chromosomes, i.e. another female. Mary would only have been able to reproduce a daughter, never a son. So when Mary, a virgin, gave birth without a man to a boy, there could be no human or scientific explanation for that event. And that's exactly the way God wanted it. Since the human male determines the sex of the child, it is obvious that the sex of Jesus' human nature was determined supernaturally by God. I, I, I get asked, and uh, maybe you do as well, is it essential to believe that Jesus was conceived in a virgin? Is the virgin birth a kind of basic 101 requirement? The answer, folks, is absolutely yes. Because it is essential to saving faith to put your trust in the true Christ. You must believe that Jesus is who he is. And who he is is God and man. And that is preserved and in a sense launched, if you like, in this very truth of virgin conception. It's what people in creedal orthodox traditions will say on a regular basis, I believe in Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Let me tell you something about, about the Christian faith. It is based upon the fact that God was conceived and born in a human womb. It's the incarnation. And the incarnation is the foundation of Christianity. And if we play around with that, if we tamper with that, we tamper with the nature of Jesus Christ. And if you come up with any other than the Christ of the New Testament, you have a false religion. If we say that Jesus is a man and only a man, if we say that he is a good man, a noble man, if we say that Jesus is a created angel, if we say anything other than that he was and is the God-man, 
we've got something other than the Christian faith. Yeah? In order to be the son of God, he had to be born of God. In order to be the son of man, he had to be born of a woman. And that is precisely what happened. God came in human flesh. <laughs> and just as Mary was trying to come to terms with the angel's announcement, bless her, she's given something else to chew on by Gabriel. He says, even Elizabeth, verse 36, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. All right, folks, let's, let's come to the conclusion, which runs from verse 38 of our passage, and uh, I think it's really the submission of Mary. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me, as, as you've said. Do you see how the narrative journey of Mary is captured here? How can it be, Lord, becomes let it be, Lord. Let it be. May it be according to your word. Mary uh, commits to move forward with God at this point as God's slave girl, literally, God's handmaiden. Mary commits to the journey with God from the only position any of us ever can, from the position of humility and trust. You see, if, if we want to experience the grace and the greatness of God in our lives, then that's where we start, by bending low and submitting. Mary, in all the frailty of her humanity, Mary submits. She dares to believe the word of the God of the impossible. And for her, as for any of us, that can take remarkable courage. Grace does not necessarily make life easy for us. If you think about Mary's story, it has not yet ended, has it? She's not yet burst into song. That comes in a, in, in a while. But for her, submission will be a long and hard road. She has to face her parents with this news. What on earth is she going to tell them? Their daughter will be, the, will be the, the subject of village scandal and social ostracism. And what is Joseph going to say? Well, we know from Matthew's gospel that, Ma that, that Joseph has his own little narrative. Says Mary to Joseph one day, I mean, this is my imagination. Joseph, when you finish your soup, I've got something I really need to tell you. Okay, Mary, go ahead. Joseph, I'm, I'm going to have a baby. You what? I'm going to have God's baby, Joseph. And Joseph just gets up and walks out of the room and slams the door. As far as he's concerned, there's only one possible explanation for what his fiancée has just said. He's not the father. He knows that. So it must be someone else. And in the account of Matthew's gospel, Joseph remains in that presumable state of shock until he gets his own personal visit again from the busy angel of the Lord, telling him the identity of the father and the destiny of the baby and to continue his, his marriage to Mary. And at that point, Joseph joins Mary on the road he too says, Lord, let it be, according to your word, let it be. Then Mary, back to our passage now, makes the visit south to her 
to her cousin Elizabeth, and as they greet each other, you know what happens in the story. Their bumps touch, and the, 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 the baby in Elizabeth's uh, womb leaps, says Luke, leaps, and notice this, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and in a loud voice exclaimed, blessed are you, Mary, among women. I was just struck by that little reference to the Holy Spirit. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth, uh, she exclaimed, you're blessed, Mary. It's the Holy Spirit who, who gives Elizabeth eyes to see what's truly happening here. This is not the normal uterine kickabout of a baby. This is the Holy Spirit giving Elizabeth insight into the identity of that kicking baby. Isn't that how, how any of us grasps Really, what's going on spiritually? Isn't it the Holy Spirit who's the author of that in your life and mine? Who is it that reveals the meaning of the mystery of God become man? It's the Holy Spirit. Who is it that enables us to trust God along the journey of grace and submit to God? It's the Holy Spirit. Who is it who enables us to respond to the invitation to dare to believe this God of the impossible. It's the Holy Spirit's work. Friends, and with this, I, I really am closing. In, in the end, in the end, we cannot work God out by calculus. We cannot get to God by our mathematical equations and scientific evidences by our rational fixes and by our spread betting analyses. We cannot get to God that way. It is God who gets to us, who opens our eyes to truth, who brings us to the point of trust and submission, who gives us grace to say, not just how will this be, but let this be. God comes to us. He has to. He, he and he alone makes the connection. And he does so in the only language that you and I can ever really understand. It's the language of personal encounter. He comes does God personally, to be encountered by us personally, person to person. He moves into our neighborhood. He becomes one of us in order to relate to each of us. My spirit rejoices, Mary will sing, in God my Savior. That was Mary's song. I wonder, is it yours? Is it ours? My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Is he your Savior? Let's pray. Lord, in this Christmas season, this time of Advent, thank you for the truth that holds the whole, the whole party together. that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, became what he was not, man, without ever ceasing to be what he was, God. Lord, give us the eyes of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, not just to understand how this will be, but that when your grace invades our lives, and sometimes uncomfortably as it did for Mary, 
taking her along that bumpy road of explanation and scandal and the whiff of illegitimacy and the complications of life, when your grace invades us and disturbs our comfort, may we be like Mary, your servant. May we say to you, Lord, let it be that our spirit may rejoice in God, our Savior. Amen.